the uh the coinbase question alessandro that you guys were asking before um i don't know right like i'm i'm kind of torn because the company with their resources and the the you know and how smart i know some of the people are that work there would make me believe that they would be prepared for that and then it's you know not just like a traffic or volume issue you know especially given that I don't know. I mean, again, maybe I'm just looking at the data wrong, but especially that Binance does a whole lot more volume than they do. Um, but so then there's one side's like, okay, I could see the strategic, you know, need to sort of shut it off because that's definitely happened in past cycles, I think, with a, a high likelihood. But the way at which the data went out is so bad for the optics of, of the business of Coinbase because if you're going to, you know, have the data go out, and you show somebody that their balance is zero and not, you know, like just show like skeleton loading or something where, you know, it's just trying to fetch the data and it can't, that's what you would do if you had any brains in your organization to like not have people freak out and see a zero balance. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm kind of torn on how I feel about what happened over, over the, the last couple of times when Coinbase had their outages and peak traffic. Yeah. I, you know, it had, Coinbase not had an extensive track record of crashes, I would be a little more concerned. But because this is something that's gone on for such a long time, and now volume is so much higher, uh, I actually tend to think that it is an honest issue. But, you know, <laughs> anything could happen. Yeah, Fred, do you, do you think, uh, or Justin, I mean, I know you have your hand up, man, I want to jump the line if you had something to add to that, but um, do you guys think that, uh, you know, we were talking about, like, what kind of risk exists within Bitcoin, and, you know, at this point, I, you know, I don't think anything really has, like, a high quantifiable, like, percentage risk towards, like, the, the, the health and success and longevity of Bitcoin, but do you guys, like, how do you guys analyze the risk of, like, Coinbase's role kind of at the center of, like, custody and, you know, fulfilling orders and et cetera, like, just with, you know, now that the ETFs are in the mix, like, do you, do you think, like, that proposes or, or presents any kind of, like, large-scale risk, Fred, that, you know, is, is, a, is a bigger factor now than it was, like, I don't know, last cycle or a year ago? I mean, these guys can move away from Coinbase too, right? I mean, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think they're wed to the hip to Coinbase. I think if we start seeing glitches, they will move. So who knows? My my prediction is at one twenty one, four twenty. Still, we have several factors at play. The ETF, obviously. We also have the macroeconomic environment going on, All right? The banks just stopped the back, the Fed just stopped the backstop of the banks this week. And then we have the sovereigns. We know that there's a sovereign coming. You think if they had any sense, they'd get here before the having, right? So I think with those two factors, uh, I could really push this thing up quick. Yeah, Dallas, I was just going to mention right quick that there's a video on YouTube uh, that Amazon AWS was very, very proud in November um, at their big event, reInvent. Uh, the keynote there was how they had built Coinbase, a sub-second round-trip latency international exchange using their very, very best stuff. So Amazon ECT, EC2, Z1D, Amazon Aurora. So basically it can hap handle whatever the world throws at it. So it's a little bit difficult to believe that um, a little bit of volume could bring them to their knees and that they would actually be reporting zero balances. A little bit tough to believe that. Yeah, so Josh Mandel had put a post up uh, a few days ago saying that he was thinking um, Coinbase was being attacked from you know, the outside. One thing I wanted to ask this group is... Hey, Big, Big Mac, I, I don't know if you can hear Nick. He was just talking. If you can't, you should drop down and come back. 
Yeah, no worries on that. So Josh Mandel was saying he thought Coinbase is being attacked from yeah, the. I can't hear him either, by the uh, way. Okay, from being yeah. attacked from the outside, I can jump off and jump back on. Yeah, you, you probably should, Nick. I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. Big Mac, then let me let me mention what I was going to mention. I, I know it's on Coinbase. We definitely have some some issues over there. But what does everyone think about Bitcoin miners? You know how how we we have this huge investment, right? How do we protect this investment? And the way that we protect this investment is we have to protect the Bitcoin miners, and the Bitcoin miners in America are under attack, right? We have the government coming after them several different ways. So how can we get these Bitcoin miners and give them the ability to generate their own electricity, whether it's through solar, combined heat and power? You know, we have many different technologies. But let's think, let's say this thing does go high, right? They're going to lose all the tax breaks. Right now in Texas, they're paying 2.5 cents. That's killer. Okay, that's, that's not going to fly if this thing goes higher. Right, that's not going to fly with with the with the common people to allow that that type of price, right, to pay. And so there's going to be a tremendous amount of pressure put on these miners at some point, right? As this price increases, they'll make money, but they'll be they'll be they'll be a new force from the other side. And so how can we as a group, right, help protect our asset, right? Stand on that wall, as Sailor mentioned. Does anybody? Think about that. Uh, it just seems like the market will adapt and go where the cheap energy is. Also, I would, uh, my, my opinion is there's too much money invested in miners right now. And so, you know, this will kind of thin the herd out a little bit, you know. And uh, maybe maybe that's good for the ecosystem. Why do we need 600 exa hash anyways? I don't, I'm not... Not clear that we need that level of uh, "quote unquote" security. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. Can you guys hear me okay now? Okay, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, you know, Fred, you posted about the the miners. I think earlier today or yesterday, and having done a bit of mining myself and seeing all that, I agree with you a hundred percent. The you know, I think we were all looking for you know. Bitcoin analogs before the ETF came along besides MicroStrategy and Grayscale to get some exposure in, you know, our conventional accounts. Um, but, you know, that that need is kind of gone. And the mining business is, I mean, it is cutthroat. It is slim margin. And, and I wouldn't want to touch that, um, you know, with a 10-foot pole. So... And as far as the regulatory stuff, yeah, that's kind of the sad thing. And until, you know, until we get to the point where, you know, mega whole coiners are going to be able to influence policy or we're really influencing policy, we just kind of have to deal with the environment that is and, you know, capital goes to where it's treated best. So just like what you were saying. Uh, yeah, so it'll, it'll just go around. But back to the Coinbase thing, I am curious about uh, about Coinbase the, the, the vulnerability of Coinbase, considering that we kind of have all of our eggs in one basket with respect to these ETFs held there. And I know um, Fred and British, you guys, you know, Brown British isn't on here, but you guys had talked about, you know, high end multi sig custodial stuff and how all that works. And we were talking about the Amazon back end. Um, I, I am just kind of curious about just vulnerability, considering a huge portion of the market cap of Bitcoin is in there or is going to be in there. And then real quick, just finishing up what I was saying before, Josh Mandel was saying on the Coinbase outages, he was saying that it might be a purposeful attack um, using, I'm reading it right now, using technique of putting bids and offers in so quickly that it freezes their system. And I'll post a link to that tweet on this on this thread here on this space. But yeah, curious your guys' thoughts on the, on the vulnerability of Coinbase um, considering so many of the ETFs are there. It's a bottleneck, yeah, no I doubt. Think, yeah, I think, I think Fred gave a decent, you know, point earlier. It's just, I don't know if it's systemic and if it continues to be an issue, I think these funds have the ability to move balances to a different custodian and if it becomes bad for business, they'll, they'll probably do that. So 
probably not a whole lot more to say on it than that. But but Fred, I guess to the question of the uh, of the space, um, 100K before having. So you know, not to be too literal with the numbers, but you know, if you're looking at kind of that multiplier effect we talked about in the previous space, where you know, let's say something around like 50x, Bitcoin needs to go up about 500 billion roughly um, to get us there. So you know, that's what 10 billion in inflows, and so I guess the question is like. How likely is it that we're going to get 10 billion of net inflows over the next 34 days? Very likely. Yes, very likely. I agree. Hey, did you all see this uh, micro strategy just put out a press release, uh, I guess about two hours ago? They're going to rinse and repeat. The 500 million? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, rinse, we, we, we were wondering why not 1 billion. No, I'm joking. We were all impressed. Especially a few days. I mean, it's it, it's repeat. like I think Michael Michael Saylor needs to go to Gamblers Anonymous <laughs> here. You know, he's like, "Hi, my name is Michael Saylor, and I'm addicted to Bitcoin. I've been buying Bitcoin at a five hundred million dollar a clip every week, and uh, you know, I got I I have a problem. I'm addicted." He said on the interview, and I don't know if it's right. It just seems weird. He got a sixty five or sixty nine basis point loan. That seems wow. usually convertible. Sixty-five. Yeah. Usually convertible debt is is higher coupon. Uh, so I, it's, I mean, more power to them if they got that. But so wh where are they sourcing like that eight hundred million? Where, where are they sourcing that from, and who is willing to do that at a sub one percent interest rate? Can Mr. you guys Mr. help Magoo. people understand that? Huh? Mr. Magoo, who would give them that kind of money for at, at less than one percent? No, but for real, I mean, do you, do you, Fred, do you know? Yeah, I don't. I don't know who they got the the last batch from at all. But you know, uh, all I know is, didn't Bill Miller have uh, a bunch of that stuff, or maybe he just had the straight stock? I don't know. Well, his his stock has skyrocketed, right? So is he able to tap in? And we, we want him to get to two ten. Right, which we're hoping he gets to 210, 210,000. He's going to get almost there, there or is he, probably with the 500 million, is there? You, there's a there's a graph out zero hedge just put out. It shows shows micro strategy compared to to um, BlackRock getting the. You know, obtaining Bitcoin, you can see that, the, you know, they're, they're already reached them, right, in just a couple of months. And so we talked about that. What is what is everyone's feel on BlackRock forking this and starting their own Bitcoin? I think it's a technical uh, possibility, but it's very unlikely. Uh, BlackRock wants to make money, doesn't want to fork uh, Bitcoin. It also doesn't have any interest. Uh, it's making fees with the price of Bitcoin. The higher the price, the, the more fees they made. So they don't have an uh, interest on this, my opinion. Yeah, same here. One, one note back on what you were saying, um, the loan that MicroStrata got for 0.69%, um, Sailor was saying there were some special terms around it that were even cooler than that low interest rate, like the loan couldn't be called uh, for some like long period, it, it he really was honing in on the low risk version of that loan, just because he's playing the long game. And if this, if this if Bitcoin goes way way down, all those haters are always saying he's going to get liquidated. But he's he's got so many like uh, so much collateral in Bitcoin that it, it's not even really even a concern for for Michael's uh, strategy. And the other thing is. Uh, somebody I really enjoy following about MicroStrategy or well, about Bitcoin in general is putting out there that there's like 19% of the, I think the flow or maybe the, the money heading towards MicroStrategy or the purchases are in shorts. So he was just, you know, slyly saying, hey, what is this? Is this going to be the next dumb money movie? <laughs> are people going to ride this thing to the moon because there's so much shorts that are going to have to get covered? But I thought that was really interesting. Be curious if anybody's watching that. I've not been watching it, but uh, we got a lot of smart people in here. I, I don't, 
I mean, maybe somebody knows it and they've just been quiet, but like I'm reading into it and it's like the notes were sold in a private offering to persons reasonably believed to be qualified institutional buyers. I just, I'm trying to square in my head who, or what, what, what's like the, the profile of somebody that's like, okay, here's tens of millions or hundreds of millions or whatever kind of clip they're in that for willing to do so at sub 1% interest rates. Like, is it not somebody that has an interest in MicroStrategy success that like, that's the only way I could maybe quantify that, like make that makes sense. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make sense of like where, who, what kind of people gave that money? Like, it's, yeah. State player possibly. I have a different direction question. This is Rob, and first of all, thanks for everyone uh, for contributing such great content. But um, I just saw a statistic today that said there are 1,500 new millionaires being made each day as a result of Bitcoin's rise. And if we continue on this vector, there's going to be a lot of people who have, I guess, in essence, money for the first time ever. Is BlackRock going to be able to, or these other nine, going to be able to offer instruments where people can borrow? against this Bitcoin instead of taking tax hits to uh, extract this value? Yeah, because the shares in ETF are securities. So people will have access to be able to borrow against them and do all kinds of like financialization, fun, fun things to earn a yield potentially that many won't understand like what, so, but it, yeah, it'll be there. Yeah, well, what kind of terms do you think those might look like? I mean, I mean, especially if, if this goes to like 200, 300, like many are talking, and many of us on this call think that could happen. I mean, what, what do you think are some of the terms? Because I know that there's options on, like if you self-custodied, some of the terms are pretty bad. It's like 14% interest loans or something. And I'm like, well, the ETFs seem to be, this seems to be a much more palatable method where you can borrow without taking the tax in. I think that's the next phase for what we're going to see in terms of products over the next several years. You know, you bring up a good point. There's going to be a lot of new wealth that's out there and people are going to want to do things with it. Um, you know, True people who are looking to hold Bitcoin for long term, they're going to want different options, whether it's a safe way of earning interest and some sort of cash, you know, passive income that they can get, um, you know, and, and that's even different than than some sort of collateralized loan. But, you know, I think the products that are going to have to come out are going to have to be safe or people aren't going to want to do it. So I don't know if that's by way of some sort of insured product or something that is similar to an FDIC type of thing that, that will make people feel protected. Um, you know, otherwise, I just don't see people doing it. Uh, at least maybe some new people will who didn't see last cycle, the, the bloodbath that happened in a lot of situations. But we'll have to see. Now, I appreciate the input. Uh, I'll, I'll step down. Simon, jump in. Hey, guys. Um, yeah, so the, it, it's a lot more simple. Um, TradFi can get access to whatever amount it wants, clo you know, at very, very favorable rates. So, again, this is a movement towards fully collateralized full reserve banking. Um, and if you, if you have Bitcoin and a relationship with any of these traditional financial institutions and you just want to negotiate, you know, it's not, it's not like the old model where you've got a bunch of schmoes that are unregulated that don't have any kind of relationship to access capital. And therefore they've got to take, persuade a bunch of people to post Bitcoin and then they've got to figure out how to, you know, um, generate returns that outperform yield um, in order to have a collateralized lending market. This is the largest financial institutions in the world that have access to the cheapest dollars in the world um, that are going to say to you, hey, if you want to loan, 
uh, what are you willing to pay? Um, and uh, they'll, they'll be able to arbitrage the rate. And if it goes wrong, they'll just say, well, it's, a, it's an over collateralized rate, post more, post more margin. Um, it's not even that complicated. So that market will, will certainly, certainly emerge. And it doesn't need to be what it was before. Uh, it just needs to be a completely over collateralized market. Obviously, the risk is that it, it gaps down and they, they are, they're not able to meet their margin call. But look at a creditor like MicroStrategy, as long as, as long as people have ridden enough of the wealth effect um, where they've got enough Bitcoin to be able to post a margin call, then you'll, you'll, always, you'll always get that. Um, and obviously that can create a deleveraging cycle like it did before as well. Um, but uh, the difference is, is that if you actually do it, it with one of these traditional fun as long as you don't do it with a fractional reserve bank and then you end up with fractional reserve bitcoin which is what happened in 2022 with the tradition with the the, the scams and and fraudulent companies where they owed their client more bitcoin than they had and they were selling illegal securities where people didn't know the risk and they didn't know how to uh, manage a margin call um, and so you know the rates just broke the market uh, I mean, someone's going to mess that up. Uh, there's no doubt that will happen. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a lot more simple than last time. It's just straight up wealthy people doing over collateralized loans and saying what rate they're willing to pay. It's not that complicated. No, it's not that complicated. I, I think, though, you know, whether it's layer two options or, or you know, Bitcoin's got to have their sort of AOL moment that, you know, the Internet had where whether it's ease of use or, you know, new functionality, whether it's borrowing, lending, all those different types of services that can kind of, you know, all get bundled up in one. And Bitcoin hasn't had that moment yet. Um, you know, there's a race out there happening across a lot of great companies that are trying to figure it out and figure it out in different ways, but it, it hasn't happened yet, you know? And until there is that AOL moment for the protocol, you know, I don't think you're going to see the kind of adoption that we're going to see, but we're just not there yet. Well, the, the killer app is self-custody. That, that is the killer app. Um, it's So, what it, you know, you've got... Self custody, that already is a feature that's built into Bitcoin. Peer to peer transactions, when you own, own it as you wish, you know, whether that's wartime economics with multi billion dollar clearing when no one trusts fiat currencies, down to how do I feed some children in Gaza when you can't get money in and you're not actually doing anything illegal down to micro transactions, you know, um, on Lightning Network. And so all of, all of those things um, are already baked in. And then you've got the fact that um, you've got a, a money supply that can never be changed, that no one else can replicate. And so what's to say that the, the killer app isn't just money you can own money you can spend and money that has a fixed supply. Why, why do, why do we need everything sure. else as a bonus? Sure. And, and sure. people keep thinking we need that killer app, but there's nothing else in the world that has those properties. Nothing, nothing well, in look, crypto. Look, I, I'm, I'm channeling Fred a little bit and he's, he's not here right now, but you know, he always talks about how the, you know, ETF was this breakthrough where, people who don't want to self-custody, people who don't ever want to learn the technical side of Bitcoin, just want exposure, and it brings access in an easy way. I completely understand the value of Bitcoin and for all the things that you just listed. But, you know, when you really want to talk about everyday people who are looking to have something they can use easily, you know, we're in our Bitcoin bubble, in our Bitcoin sphere, where for us, this is just 
you know, this is normal. It's normal to self custody. It's it's normal to have your seed phrase hidden somewhere. It's this isn't normal for the guy who's living next door who doesn't have any Bitcoin. And you know, I, I'm not saying that people shouldn't try to learn it or, or any of that. But we definitely have to bridge the gap between, you know, these early adopters where this is just normal and commonplace and move towards... Yeah, so that's what the ETF and Coinbase already do. We've already got that. Yeah, we, we do. But how does it actually interface with your life, right? Well, how does it look, you, if, with your life for purchases it, or, yeah, or if, it provides, if it, it provides utility for one person, another person can just benefit from the third... So if it provides self-custody for one person and somebody else just says, hey, I'll just benefit from the ETF as a hedge against inflation, and then someone else says, hey, I'm trying to transact at scale. And um, so it doesn't mean that the utility, someone else can't benefit from someone else's utility. That's the whole concept of investing in a stock. You, you invest in a stock not because you necessarily want to be the user, it's because you want to profit share in the fact that that stock, stock's product is driving utility to some customer. And so just because somebody just wants to hold it within the ETF, as long as there is um, people out there that see the benefit of self-custody and peer-to-peer -peer transactions, whether it be at scale or smaller, um, then 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 you, you get this ever-contracting supply where the supply and demand economics create something that doesn't exist in any other form anywhere. And so, look, we could, we could, try, we could try and get, you know, all of the other... We could try and get the whole stock market on layer twos on top of Bitcoin, and all of that could happen. And, um, and, and maybe it drives additional value. But... Here's the reality in terms of two people spending, you will never, I will always spend my Bitcoin last when there is massive censorship or is there a reason why I can't get it there. So the times that I spend my Bitcoin is not when it's really easy for me to use a credit card or when it's really easy for me to get money from one country to another or where it's really easy for me to bank wire within the, within the domestic, um, you know, uh, databases from one bank to the other. It's when I can't get dollars in somewhere else, or it's when I absolutely need to do an instant international transfer, or it's where my bank says you cannot send that amount of money without nine months of KYC, source of funds, source of wealth, um, and just proving, you know, that you are, you're not a criminal just because you want to send a large amount of money. Um, and so that's when you spend your Bitcoin. It's not when you're trying to pay your rent. And if you do, you look back at yourself and say, I mean, how, we're all Bitcoin pizza guys. We've all got the story. We've got the, all got the transaction. And, and so if you ever want, that's why stable coins will exist on top of Bitcoin um, or on top of whatever network, because when it comes to spending money, and this is what Keynesian economics knows, that money that goes down in value is significantly better spending technology than money that goes up in value. Because money that goes up in value is savings technology, and money that goes down in value is spending technology. Uh, and, and you can't buck that trend. That's why fiat currencies will always exist, because I, I know so many people... You know, from the last 13... I, I know people that was at the original Bitcoin conference that are still at the same net worth than they were when they were at that original Bitcoin conference um, because they tried to manage their personal expenses in Bitcoin. And, um, and, and you know, and so... Uh, you will all... You know, the utility is a stable coin on top of Bitcoin as opposed to trying to get Bitcoin to be something that you'll pay your rent with and then saying that we, we won't get mainstream adoption until people can do that. It, it's just simply, you know, we, we, we have the killer application and we're now on an adoption cycle. I don't disagree with a lot of what you said. I think there's a lot of products that are going to come out that are going to help bridge the gap and make a lot of things that people want to do easier, whatever that might be. Um, Let's see, who else do we have that 
wants to speak. Alessandro, you want to jump in? Yes, um, thanks, Michael. So I I think uh, we should also consider uh, store of value um, as for me is the main uh, narrative at the moment for Bitcoin. So even if the people that have in ETF, they are using they are literally using Bitcoin. Buying the ETF means that uh, BlackRock is owning or is holding through the Coinbase, but they are literally using Bitcoin as a store of value. And for me, in this in this decade. Uh, at least in the West world, that's the narrative. Also, the medium of exchange in the West world, in uh, US or in Europe, a part of Bitcoiners or people interested in with the, the technology, if you want to pitch to the common people, my feedback is, okay, good luck with that, because it when it's not yet ready for medium of exchange, regardless of the application that we have. Firstly, we have anyhow, a good current, a good currency. So the dollars and the euro are bad money, but they are good currencies with Visa and Mastercard, or at least they are good enough. Secondly, something that went from 60k to 16k and now to 74k in such a short time, one or two years, obviously it will not be used uh, as a medium of exchange. Firstly, we need to wait that it becomes a global store of value and there is no any more uh, crashes of 60 or 70%. Then every person maybe will have savings in Bitcoin. At this time, it will be the chance to really pitch to the world uh, the medium of exchange. That's my opinion on this. Yeah, I wanted to, wanted to add a couple of things if it's cool with you guys. I think, uh, I mean, Simon's correct. I think that Bitcoin's killer app is, you know, the ability to hold it safely and transact with anybody uh, in a currency that is supported by a network that maintains its fixed supply that that is the killer app now you know when when people throw out like the terms killer apps i think a lot of it is like really what they mean is like how do we kind of reach more adoption or global adoption and, you know you can kind of measure that a couple of ways one side of it is you know how much of the world's money comes into bitcoin the other side is how many you know just total users actually have Bitcoin, understand what it is and, you know, use it day to day um, or, you know, you know what I mean? Just they, they're just users on the network. And so there's different ways to go about that. You know, the ETFs are no doubt a driver to bring in the money side, clearly. Um, you know, and then additionally, just to bring in the raw numbers of people, there's going to be, and, and there is, I mean, like, you know, it's why we're working on what we're working on and, you know, some others are building cool things. It's, you know, the experience people have with Bitcoin is limited to the tool you use to interact with it. And, you know, uh, until, you know, until recently, in my view, I think a lot of the tools to interact with Bitcoin have been, um, you know, just sort of underwhelming for how great Bitcoin is. And I think many of them, you know, people, you know, maybe people who don't have a ton of net worth or people who are just newer to Bitcoin jump on and they're like, what is this? Like, where is everyone? Like, I don't really get this. How do I learn more? There's not really like incentives tying people around like they don't even like it's like you kind of need carrot sticks to lead people where they ought to lead themselves um obviously price is a big you know it, it's it's a big like uh you know stake on a fishing rod out in front for people to run after like the higher uh price gets like that's going to bring people along but you know i think like th there, there are many killer apps that will come that will be you know intermediaries for you to interface with your bitcoin uh, the question is like, yeah, what are those? Which of those have big risks? And, you know, some of those are just going to be sort of like social related things and way to interact, ways to interact with other people. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's definitely needed. Uh, the building should not stop and, and, and it's crucial. But yeah, different people are going to use it different ways overall, I guess is my view. Yeah, I'd kind of um, think about if if we're thinking that new adoption is going to drive demand the way the way that i kind of think about it right now is that 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 threshold cross this year where the demand for individuals to hold it organizations to hold it for treasury management and learn from micro strategy and countries to hold it when they learn what happens to el salvador's debt from their bitcoin hodl um the, de the demand is there like um obviously as the price goes higher the market cap goes up and therefore it becomes increasingly 
you know, uh, it, but the, the demand is there. It's a question of how soon are people going to get on? Um, and so the, even if you created the killer app, um, the retail, the retail demand will probably not outstrip what we've got coming ahead of us. Once countries and companies realize that it's, um, they can do what micro strategy in El Salvador did. So I'm not sure if, uh, I mean, obviously we, I mean, look at the price of Bitcoin. It's a, uh, if you look at 14 years, the adoption curve is, is, is fast. It's incredibly fast. Um, but for some reason, people think it needs to be faster. Um, and, and the way that I see it, the longer that people have to get on board and, and, and try and distribute it to as many people as possible. And, you know, that won't change because Bitcoin's got eight decimal places. Um, but every four-year cycle, there's no doubt that um, there's going to be diminishing diminishing returns until eventually it converges upon something that's uh, such a high market cap that it would be uh, more stable if the economics play out. But the demand the demand's there where we are right now, and and the utility is just about giving people. It's almost like um, you know Keynesian economics is a mechanism for ensuring that the supply of currency always increases because there's utility in debt and you need to get on the right side of the debt curve in order to not be on the wrong side of wealth inequality. And so the closest you are to the central bank at scale, the cheaper the rates you can get and then you can game the system at the expense of the poorest people or those that are paying the 30% in, you know, interest rate on their credit cards. Um, Bitcoin's kind of doing the opposite. So if there is a wealth effect, then utility is probably not necessarily about driving demand from this stage. It's about making it more useful for those that are doing the opposite of Keynesian economics or Austrian economics because they're saving, decreasing time preference, um, delaying gratification, and waiting until they're wealthy until they can actually use their Bitcoin. And at that stage, they kind of want to leverage or borrow against it or do an over-collateralized loan or any of those things, or even do it with DeFi so they don't need to do so to have a financial institution in the middle. Um, and so I see the use case and the apps not necessarily about driving demand from here, but about actually making it more useful for those people that are actually playing self-custody outside of the ETF system. And the ETF system is just going to be you know, a, a, a contractor of an ever-increasing, um, you know, people that, that see selling, you know, selling, not, not, not buying and selling Bitcoin, but actually buying and selling dollars and using, using Bitcoin to buy dollars is the, the silliest trade one will ever make. Uh, and that's kind of a transition and a psychological shift that more and more people are going to have to get their head around. And it wasn't really something people could get their head around with gold because gold was obviously always used by the wealthy to preserve their wealth. But because they couldn't audit the supply, whenever the supply increases, you know, that led to different economics and gold rushes and various other things. And because it wasn't easily transportable, they always had to custody it with someone else. And then when you do that at the sovereign level, you, you lose your sovereignty because a central bank could end up just saying, no, we're not going to send you your gold. So just more, more and more people are going to discover that over time. And all, all Bitcoin needs to do is give, give people the ability to create these, these different types of utility but just remain as commodity-like as possible because it's already doing everything it needs to do, I think. Simon, Simon, can I ask you a super quick question? I mean, like, just kind of first principle, super basic, like, thought progression. It's like, you know, if more people can't afford to hold more of their wealth in Bitcoin, um, I, you know, obviously there's nuances, rabbit holes are going into, but that's better, right? And I think more people will be able to do that the larger Bitcoin gets, because the larger it gets, I think that the downside volatility that people are scared of that prevents a lot of people from keeping a majority of their wealth in Bitcoin will reduce. 
And so if, if those assumptions are generally correct, why would we want to get there slower when there's a, a, so much benefit to be had by people on the other side of that? Like, I get it. And like, okay, hey, let's go slower. Maybe, you know, a higher number of people may be able to acquire Bitcoin cheaper now. But like really for, for the raw number of like these humans in the world, like it, they will benefit a lot better once Bitcoin's a way, way, way larger thing. And I think used as a unit of account and used and they can afford to keep, you know, the majority, if not all their wealth in it because they're not, you know, using it in something else, right? Where it's, you know, obviously slowly melting for them and has all the other restrictions that fiat has in different ways. Do you, you get what I mean? Or do you? Hmm. Well, so I see volatility as wealth redistribution. So volatility is just simply a way of those that have conviction um, taking the wealth of those that didn't have conviction. And so anyone that's thinking in terms of dollars will only ever see the dollar price of Bitcoin because they're not measuring their wealth in Bitcoin. They, they don't see the market going down as a good thing for their Bitcoin wealth because they can buy more Bitcoin with their fiat wealth. They see it as, um, you know, because they're, they're, they're still in the world of how can I use Bitcoin in order to be able to increase my purchasing power in dollars? And, um, but is that not the reason like, why, like, like think about the El Salvador, like many businesses in El Salvador, like a lot of them receive Bitcoin, but like they have a different currency that makes up, you know, the liability side of their balance sheet. And so a lot of them, because of the potential downside volatility, need to sell out of it and back into dollars, thus perpetuating the system at which yeah, Bitcoin and, and created that's the, that's to replace. The wealth, that's the wealth redistribution because they're selling it to somebody that understands the the long the long term value of it, and so you you continually get a, a manipulation of those that need short term liquidity to those that don't need short term liquidity in an environment where you need to give it time for your value to increase, and so that's that's like just you know, that, that's what the, the volatility actually does. Now, on the speculative side, we've already seen that um, actually when you have higher volatility, um, as we see with shit coins and meme coins and all sorts of stuff, uh, that tends to drive a lot more interest from the, from the speculative side of the market than stability. Because if you look at what's the most stable asset in the world that's ever exists, it's gold. Everyone finds gold boring as shit. Um, no ideological alignment um, and just something that they really, you know, is just associated with boring people kind of psychologically. And then you've got like the other end of the spectrum, like a Pepe coin where you've got full blown community, crazy people trying to make money, people get wrecked and stuff like that. So you actually tend to see the larger community around things that are more speculative and and more volatile than just pure because you know as bitcoiners we're we're like you know if you if you think of the new the next generation of people that come along they're looking at us bitcoiners saying are you crazy like look how much look how much i just made out of pepe coin or dogecoin and i need a 1000 x not a not a not like a you know a, a 2x or anything um and so, you know, to make like massive generalizations around lower volatility means that more people are going to want to participate is something we actually haven't seen. It tends to be the more boring it gets, the more stable it gets, the, the more people, you know, just, just see, some, see something that is about a wealth preserver. Uh, yeah, I got a few. I mean, a few points I want to add to that, but I, I know Ben and Euphoric have their hands up, so jump in, guys, if you'd like. Oh, hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah, you want to go ahead, Euphoric? Can I can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, no. yes, you're clear. Go ahead. Yeah. Awesome. I just want to. I think it was Rob talking earlier about um, like margin or taking loans. I just want to add a little bit of context. I think. Right now, you can only hold the ETF and um, 
like a brokerage account or, or an IRA, you can't really take loans um, in an IRA and you can't hold ETFs in a, a 401k. So just, you know, just to answer that question, it's like probably no in general. I guess you can do it in a individual account, um, you know, depending on your custodian. But in, in general, any retirement accounts, I don't think you can, you can do that. that. That's all I want to add. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll back that up. My wife's having trouble with it, too. And I heard somebody, I think it was Caitlin Long, talking about how the, the wirehouses like Merrill Lynch and uh, uh, the other big name, that they're going through like 30, 60, even more, 60-day-plus processes of letting, the, I think it's probably letting the ETFs cure some kind of risk-averse process, but it kills me. Like, uh, you can Google on my, my wife's uh, 401k type stuff, and it, they're like, what are you? What are we supposed to do? Everybody's asking about Bitcoin. Here's what we'll do for you. We'll give you GBTC or MSTR. Those are the best we can do right now until we go through a process. And you know, I, I can't help but wonder if that's partially why there's upward pressure on uh, MicroStrategy because there, there's tons of people who are. I mean, I'm pushing my wife to put this money in, you know, but she can't. She's stuck. Um, luckily, MSTR has been ripping, so it's all been great. But. Um, yeah, so good point. Um, what, what I was going to bring up is uh, something Simon said, and I know this is a nuance and it might be overspoken about, but I think, I think Simon, you said uh, as we go on, there'll be diminishing returns. And I, I, uh, I mean, everything in me says this is an S-curve and we're not um, like, like the guy, uh, the super math guy who – Fred is debating or bringing on a lot, and he, he doesn't like uh, stock to flow very much. But that math guy, I think he's just playing wrong. He's got this thing that converts with power laws, and it works great. But we're looking at the very bottom of the S curve. We haven't started going up. He, he's he's assuming fifteen years is enough time to put us in the middle of an S curve of a developing tech, and that's totally wrong. I, I mean, I think we're I think we're at the bottom of the S curve. Like people are just starting to buy cars. We, we like the barrier entry to go from a horse and saddle to a car has just been removed with the ETFs. So everyone, like the numbers, the people, the adoption, which drives Metcalf's law, is. I mean, it's it's looking exponential. I think if we could get our hands on the number of souls that are buying into Bitcoin now because of the ETFs. That's adoption, and and it's real money. It's not like this scary. Let me dabble a hundred dollars into this weird thing with a whole new wallet, and I'm scared of it. This is going through BlackRock, so I'm putting a percent of my retirement portfolio in there, which is way more than a hundred bucks for people who have those kind of accounts. So, anyways, I would say that's true adoption versus you know a hundred dollar cold wallet somewhere. That's not really using store value. If you're storing value, you're putting in percentages of your entire estate. And that's happening really fast now compared to last year or the previous four-year cycle. I mean, that was a whole nother thing, um, whole nother thing. And just headwinds all left and right. So um, that's my spiel. And I, I may have heard you wrong when you were speaking towards it, Simon, but I, I really disagree with the power law and the diminishing returns idea. I think that's going to be blown out of the water. And we're seeing it, you know, day by day. We've got a small data set since the ETS were approved with two or three months, but I mean, it's becoming clearer every day. We just had a billion dollars come in. It's we're gonna we're gonna rip past the tops of that power law top, and probably never visit his bottoms again. That's just, those are my thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when when I say um, diminishing returns, I think in four year cycles. So the first cycle we got one one point two million percent returns. The second cycle we got two hundred fifty thousand percent returns. The third cycle, we got um, 2,300 percent returns, um, and so I can't imagine us ever returning to a cycle where we get one million two hundred percent returns again. Um, so, although although they will be, um, everything you've said could be the case, but as the market cap gets bigger and big, you know, what are we at? So we're at, we're approaching one and a half trillion. My cut off. We're approaching one and a half trillion. Gold is what just over 12 trillion the market cap of fiat currency is 165 trillion um so even if you went from 
Bitcoin being bigger than the entire market cap of all fiat currency, it still wouldn't produce the returns that came from cycle one. Yeah, so, I, I mean, with yeah, go ahead, cycle go one, Simon, yeah, I mean, it's just, just math, right? I mean, how, you know, to go from whatever, you know, <laughs> like a very tiny number uh, to, to what it went to, that, yeah, that's just not going to be possible. But I mean, I guess that, that when people are saying diminishing returns, I think they just mean the fact that like, you know, 2020, uh, or I'm sorry, 2017 to the 21 peak of 69 that like many, many people sort of assume that like the growth from 69 to whatever happens to sort of a peak this cycle is just going to follow a diminishing pace. And I think most people are saying that that is going to be broken. Uh, not that it's going to somehow outpace, you know, the 2013 or before cycles. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. Um, are, are we going to are we going to be following? Are we going to be following this? What Dallas said, but but yeah, I, I think I think we're going to. I mean, we're going to blow past the X's that we were experienced in the 2017 run up, or sorry, 2021, 2020 run up. But 2017, I think we'll see something more like that, and maybe even 2013, which sounds sounds stupid to say we'd get that many X's if we're starting at. Uh, depends where you start, but you could start at the low 15k from this cycle or you could start at the having which who knows what that'll be but 70k or more like i really think we're gonna see things that are gonna blow minds because we're we're seeing the multiplier play out in a you know silly way where like 150 billion like those forecasts saying 150 billion the most bullish ones before the etf were like 150 billion comes in in the first two years and everybody's like wow that's I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> and that was bullish for the time. But it, we're on pace right now to do $150 billion this year if it keeps up. Who knows? But if it keeps up, $150 billion puts us um, over $400,000 by Christmas. So, I mean, it, it's a trend. Like, And I'm trying to tell myself there's no way this keeps going, right? It, it just It's too crazy to think $400,000 by the end of this year. But it's exponential thinking, and I, you know, I think 147 billion. When you're looking at a market cap of bonds, which are the most boring thing ever, that have 300 trillion dollars, that are, you gotta think at least five percent of those bonds are like, get me out of these things. Hey, P.S. What's this Bitcoin? You know, <laughs> or you hear stories of Bitcoiners. The more burned in we get, I'm one of them. You know, I'm. I'd love to get rid of a rental house and do that kind of thing. But you, I hear Bitcoiners doing it all the time. They're not just, they're not just dipping their toe in anymore. They've been in for a little while and they're like, Oh yeah, this is where it's at. So people are coming in in size and the real estate market is 300 trillion also. So, and, and the, actually the investment real estate, you got to live in a house, right? But the investment real estate market, it was like worldwide. It's like 187 trillion, at least on a quick Google. So, I mean, point being, one trillion coming into Bitcoin, uh, I mean, I just shared that it looks like 150 billion takes us to $400,000 Bitcoin, but what would a trillion do? And that's easy to rationalize many trillions coming in, in my opinion. So, okay, hopefully I didn't cool the room again or my internet didn't break, but that's my no, thoughts. No, solid points, man. Yeah, and that's, that's the real question on are we going to be are we going to be hitting this S curve or are we going to kind of continue to bump along the power the power law and and Fred had actually mentioned that after he interviewed Giovanni and spoke with him a few times about the power law is he's like yeah I think how where Fred go I, didn't he start yeah, he was I don't know where he dipped off to yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's what he was saying. It was like, oh, you know, power law for now. But but and he was speaking with somebody else, another mathematician about about going into an S curve, and you know the the ETFs opening up in these these massive pools of capital, these trillions and hundreds of trillions that we're getting, you know, portions of allocations into to really catalyze. Are we seeing this an uptrend, like what Ben was saying? Are we going to see? The, are we seeing this uptick into an S curve? And this could really be that uptick into an S curve, and it could really break previous models of 
stock to flow and power law, and it it could get it could get crazy. Well, I think I think you can have that. So with stock to flow, I think it, um, last time I checked it out, it said eighty five trillion market cap in two cycles. So that would make it four times the market cap of US dollar based upon stock to flow. So I think stock to flow factors in, um, you know, uh, the, the S curve analysis into it. Yeah, that, that's, in, that's interesting. Um, I guess I didn't look at stock to flow that, that far out. Um, but, you know, that also gets kind of back into what we were saying earlier and going back and forth about, um, you know, like the speculative holders versus the store of value holders and, you know, the, and the volatility of the asset. Do you, got, do you guys think that as adoption goes up, as we reach the top of the S-curve, say, you know, a couple cycles out, do you see volatility coming down? And then, you know, it being more of a store of value type asset for normal people. Because here's the thing, you know, I agree with, I agree with you in one sense of, oh, Bitcoin is, you know, it's wealth redistribution, uh, you know, from low conviction people to high conviction people. There's a lot of gamblers out there. And when you talk about like the, the pools of capital that flow into Bitcoin, I was looking at the previous cycle, no institutional money and the, the amount of money that people just have to throw at stuff, to gamble. I mean, there's $23 billion gambled on the Super Bowl. You know, and, and so I think like Americans, where a lot of the global wealth is, like to gamble, you know, they, they're into the shit coins, they're doing all this, and and they like to throw money at Bitcoin, and then we see the, you know, we see our cycle drawdowns. Um, but but are, are we going to see a, a public consciousness shift of Bitcoin as we, you know, we S-curve, as we stabilize, and, and as as all that gets pushed through? And and one of the, one of the key points that I think might help catalyze that is when Bitcoin begins to reach the market cap of gold, right? We're, we're already seeing, I mean, this cycle, it'd be nice, this cycle if we reach market cap of gold. And now in the public consciousness, we're comparing, oh, here's gold and here's digital gold. Now among us maxis, I think we all can give a better description than digital gold. But for, you know, for normal people out there, I think digital gold is you know it's an it's an easy description, um, but then kind of going back to those those low conviction people. There's also and, and this, here's where I wonder if we want to just keep in mind there are the gamblers right there are us the maxis, but then there's also a lot of people that I run into that I come in contact with who think it's a good idea but really don't understand the depth behind it. And, you know, and therefore don't necessarily have the conviction to ride the cycle down. But when we reach, you know, S-curve adoption, um, maybe that would be a more comfortable place with that. Just, yeah. Yeah, I think um, we, we hit some really big milestones this month. Um, and I think they're very symbolic. Uh, one was we hit, we beat, we um, went over the market cap of silver. Obviously, silver has a much worse stock to flow, um, but we, you know, we kind of showed that utility and that use case. And the second thing we did is we became the thirteenth largest um, currency in the world when we and we took over the Swiss franc. And obviously, the Swiss franc is the most geopolitically neutral fiat currency in the world. That um, is historically the fiat currency you want to be in. In, in a time of war and you're looking for geopolitical neutrality. And so the fact that Bitcoin has now passed silver and the Swiss franc, I think is very symbolic. And I think if when we pass the market cap of gold, uh, you know, that, that will be a, another. And, and that's why if you, if you steady in, um, you know, to, to me, I, I like the steady, but Bitcoin's never given us the steady. You know, it's always been radical. It's always been extreme moves. And it's always been manipulated. So you've always had short-term manipulation from those that control the most amount of Bitcoin. You know, we'll chuck a load of Bitcoin at Coinbase or an exchange and then fear people into thinking there's a sell order and all the shenanigans we've seen all along. 
um, you know, yeah, I, I think, um, but now we're going to see all that from hedge funds and tradfies and, and all that stuff. So the, the, it will still be the same, the same games, but they'll just be done in a regulated environment uh, from those that uh, are able to pay the fines and get away with it. Um, yeah. But yes, yeah, so so, it's a good it's a good market cap silver and Swiss franc. I think that's solid. I mean, yeah, like milestones for sure. And Nick got me thinking about. I mean, twenty five billion thing on the Super Bowl. Um, you know, it, it, you're right. Like all the gamblers flooded in. People in my neighborhood didn't even care about Bitcoin. They wanted Dogecoin. And I'm like, what the heck, you guys? Like, <laughs> pay attention. But, you know, everybody came in for the free, quick money. And and I'm wondering right now, just watching MSTR, I mean, Sailor gets on the news and he gets 13 minutes at a time and just slays it. So I wonder if there can't be a movement for the gambling mentality to create another gold rush flow. And, you know, it, this would be way more healthy than Dogecoin. At least MSTR, they're going to come at this, like, short squeeze with a, you know, something that benefits Bitcoin and it'll make them kind of maybe ask the question, what's this Bitcoin and why, why is Matt, why is this happening? You know, but we do need the, the spicy stuff to bring people in. To, yeah, yeah, and, where, and then where does the division happen between the diamond hands and the lettuce hands? Where does the division happen between the people who are like, oh, I'm interested in this, and then, oh, I have conviction about this? I mean, that's kind of my story is I started with some mining stuff because I had some free electricity, and I'm just digging around and digging around, and I didn't really know the difference between, you know, shits and Bitcoin. And, and I found Sailor a good communicator and I really, you know, <laughs> obsessively started studying, but like, okay, so that's what I did. And, and is my reward just to be, you know, riding the Bitcoin wave and other people aren't, is, is that the dividing point or, you know, and, and like the last cycle, we just shook out all the lettuce hands and, you know, and here we're starting another, another cycle, but, um, and what is, what is the future hey, Nick, for the holders? Everybody. Everybody gets Bitcoin at the price they deserve. Bitcoin is, you know, available for everyone and waits for no one. It's the beautiful part about it. It's going, it's, it's on the tracks and you're either on the train or you're not, um, despite there being a, maybe a bumpy ride along the way. But I think to, just back a second ago, I wanted to respond Nick, to that question you asked. I mean, I don't know. It's like my, you know, like to Simon's point, it's like when you have a bigger or a smaller asset, right? It's obviously takes less dollars to move it a higher percentage right which is why you're going to have vol you know higher volatility let's say of like whatever some tiny meme coin versus you know something like bitcoin obviously um and so you know a simple assumption might be okay well you know as bitcoin becomes way bigger it's going to have less volatility and i like I, you know part of that i'm like yes i i think that, that that is true in some regards but the other side that's kind of the, the wild card factor is like you know, you're still measuring that in dollars. And what does like a, you know, a, a $14 trillion, $20 trillion Bitcoin market mean for the world? Like how, how, you know, how much crazier and more volatile does the world become when, you know, the U.S. government has $50 trillion in debt or $100 trillion in debt? And what does that look like? I don't know, right? And so there's still maybe tons of volatility because the thing you're measuring, measuring it against becomes you know, in, in a more dire situation or a crazier situation. But um, yeah, I mean, oh, that's why I think like, again, like it has to get to a certain size for people for it to probably reasonably make sense to use it as a unit of account. Obviously, if you listen to like Jeff Booth and others, right, the, the, the simple thinking is that, you know, when you have a fixed supply, you actually, you know, get to then benefit from the deflationary effects of technology when, when you know, you're measuring the price of goods in that. And so hopefully it's like, that's the world I want to get to. And I think, you know, the only way to sort of get there sooner is by having Bitcoin be a bigger thing um, when measured in dollar terms until it's so big in dollar terms that we don't really care very much about what it is in dollar terms the same way you don't care about what it, you know, the price of Bitcoin, Mexican pesos or Argentinian pesos or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know, but Simon, I'll say you have your hand up. I mean, maybe you want to add something. Yeah. Well, um, so me personally, this is just me from, from my experience. Um, I've got a very specific definition of someone that's um, that's got conviction, uh, and and from my experience, if you buy every month for four years and go through a complete bull cycle and a complete bear cycle and continue to buy with whatever percentage of your you know income you can 
you can save in Bitcoin. Um, you've seen it all. And um, if you also go through in that process um, a bit of shit coinery, um, then you've been through the cycle of understanding how gambling, you know, how much gambling that is. And did I really need to do that? Either you became incredibly wealthy because you, your gambling got you got lucky and you got it into Bitcoin and then you discovered that Bitcoin is what you really wanted. And so you were just trying to play the markets to get more Bitcoin. Or you didn't learn the lesson and you came, exited and entered the market during that four-year cycle because the dollar value was going up and down and you were in it when it was the prices were up and you were out of it when the prices were down. And that's, that's what I've experienced as conviction. So buying every single month, no matter what the price is for a four-year cycle, if you do that, you'll, my experience tells me, and I've known many people that do that, uh, you'll have the conviction to um, ride the whole cycle of everything that follows and your mindset will be trained that in the bear market was my best time because I accumulated as much Bitcoin as possible. And in the bull market, I kind of felt good, but I was a little bit gutted that I, hadn't, I didn't have more Bitcoin. And so once you, get, once you enjoy the bear market and kind of get a little bit pissy at the, at the bull market, you've got conviction. If you're only excited in the bull market and you get pissy during the bear market, you haven't got conviction. You're still in it for the dollars, not for the Bitcoin. Um, the shit coinery, I think it will always exist. <laughs> uh, the reason is, is because firstly, the whole is it or is it not a security is just a US argument. Outside of the US, the entire world is following the Financial Action Task Force um, a recommendation that you need to have a virtual asset service provider regime. And Europe already created like a very comprehensive virtual asset service provider regime that encompasses market manipulation, um, you know, insider trading, disclosure, anti-money laundering, uh, and the world is, is copying that and adjusting to that. So because now the entire world, with the exception of the US, um, have regulations built for this industry, and this is only the SEC that's trying to fight for jurisdiction for the shitcoinery, um, then that industry will continue to prevail. And, uh, the, you know, it looks like the SEC is going to lose most of its battles. And then you'll have to have a virtual asset service provider regime within the US that doesn't disrupt US capital markets, but treats it for the asset class that it is without trying to shoehorn it into SEC. And so once the U.S. has figured that out, which it will eventually, it will just be lost. Um, the whole, uh, you know, everyone going through that four-year cycle and then realizing, holy shit, I'm, I'm stuck, I'm earning dollars, I'm paying debt, and I'm just losing more and more of my income to interest in the fiat currency world, and I don't seem to be getting ahead. Ideologically, I've sound, I found this thing called an NFT or this somebody told me about this XRP thing or someone told me about Dogecoin. And then you either make a tremendous amount of money and then you realize that Bitcoin is where you want it to be. Um, but the, the higher leverage Bitcoin in, in the general crypto market, I, I think people will always be attracted by that, that gambling. Um, and I think the returns will always be higher and the ability to destroy your wealth will always be higher. But it's, it's generational as well because the, pe the people that bought, you know, bought Dogecoin in 2017 or, or all the tokens in 2017, this was the generation that was never going to be investing. This is the generation that was never, they couldn't, they couldn't get on the real estate ladder. They had no interest in the stock market. You know, bonds were just not outperforming inflation. Uh, these were the people that were never going to own anything. And then suddenly, ideologically, they just got into this weird thing for whatever reason, because someone pitched them a scam. Um, but from that, they got into investing for the first time. And now all of a sudden, they're like, um, you know, if, if, if all they end up with is, oh, right, Bitcoin was what I was meant to be doing, uh, then all the pain and frustration and lessons 
it brought them into the saving and investing market, um, which is a market that they were never going to be a part of anyway, because they were just stuck in a fiat currency debt cycle, paying off their student loan, getting a mortgage, and continually paying more and more of their of their salary into interest on debt because it's the only way to survive in the fiat currency world. Uh, so what is the what is the stance globally on those on those shit coins then? You said there's a task force in Europe on, on all of that. Um, as an American I'm much less familiar with that. With respect to considering them securities or what have you, um, how is that going elsewhere? Yes, yeah, so every, every country in the world has got a virtual asset service provider regime apart from US. And so if you operate an exchange or you're a token issuer, uh, then you need to issue a perspective, give full disclosure, and you need to register with the local regulator uh, under the virtual asset service provider regime. Um, and then at the moment, they're mainly focused on anti-money laundering um, but Europe kind of went the furthest and said, we're going to do market manipulation and insider trading. and everything, everything that's relevant in the securities market, but take out all the stuff that's not relevant um, and even go as far as doing it in a decentralized way um, in the peer-to-peer -peer market and, and how, how, how people need to interact um, with that. So the Financial Action Task Force is, um, has said to every regulator in the world, apart from the one regulator it can't control, which is the US, and said, you all have to have a virtual asset service provider regime in place by this date, and those dates have all passed. So the whole world has, uh, if you are operating in any country other than America, you can just register your exchange, and if you want to issue a token, there's a regulatory regime you have to follow. Uh, what, what, what level of enforcement they're actually doing depends upon their resources. Um, but yeah, in America, they're just, the, the SEC is just doing that territorial battle of we want jurisdiction over it and we don't want to disrupt capital markets. So we want to shoehorn it into the same regime we've, we've created to create the most successful capital market in the world. Because, you know, their issue is we don't want micro strategy delisting from uh, Nasdaq and issuing some kind of token because it gives them, it, it, you know, it, it gives them, I mean, you know, that would be the disruption of the most successful capital market. So it's just why it's taking a bit more time. Um, but then there's also the disjointed regulatory regime in the US because there's so many regulators that are all fighting for all the money uh, to try and get all the fines. And, and that's stopping them actually just creating what the rest of the world is doing. And is that, uh, is that virtual asset service provider regime from the, from the financial action task force? Is that, do you think based on the regulations that they put forth with, Hey, you need to have prospectus disclosures and all of that. Do you think that's actually going to be effective at stopping rug pulls, um, on the specific coins? And is there any insight onto how well that could also protect you know, investors, consumers from things like a, like an FTX case, um, exchanges that are, you know, printing paper, uh, you know, paper tokens, essentially. Yeah. So, um, you know, at Bank to the Future, we, we've got a registered VASP. Uh, we have to provide our, we've got audit requirements. We have to demonstrate that we have all the money that clients um, are, uh, you know, uh, uh, say we have, say we have to get an audit. Now, is there corruption? Well, only as much corruption as exists in TradFi. So, yeah, we could pay a dodgy, dodgy auditor um, and commit fraud and risk going to prison by sending that to a regulator and then getting caught. And, and that's how traditional finance works. But all of the checks and controls, um, you know, uh, 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 any good actor that doesn't want to go to prison uh, would have to follow. So, yeah, pretty much everything that FTX did, that Celsius did. So let's take the two different use cases. So Celsius was offering an illegal security where it was pitched through misleading misrepresentations that it's safer than a bank. And so then they lost loads of money because they were taking excessive risk in order to pay the yields that no one could. So they make up all the fake yield. 
Um, they then misrepresented everybody. And then when they lost money, they didn't disclose that. So when people were depositing, nobody actually knew what they were investing in. And so there was no securities disclosure. That, that could have all been resolved by saying this is a security and therefore you need to disclose exactly what the risk is and what people are, are doing uh, and what, what you're allowed to do with the money. And then they also, because they lost money and made up fake yields, they were actually engaging in fractional reserve banking. And so if there was a custody regime, then um, that would have meant that they couldn't use client assets without explicit permission to invest in a security. Um, and then when they had a hole and they didn't actually have enough funds to pay the client balances, uh, that's where that doesn't get fixed, I don't think, through regulations, because we all know that the banking system is a Ponzi scheme because it creates digital currency every time it issues a loan and there's not enough money in existence to pay the interest on the debt. So that still can't be fixed. You need actually a lender of last resort and a Ponzi scheme stabilization funds like FDIC to and, uh, and Federal Reserve to guarantee fractional reserve banking. So fractional reserve... I don't think you can have fractional reserve Bitcoin sustainably because you could never insure an asset that goes up in value. Uh, you'd always have to take fiat currency risk with that. And then if the value of Bitcoin goes up too high, the insurer will never be able to cover the losses. Um, so everything with the exception of banking works. But yeah, I think if you had custody, securities laws, market manipulation, um, then FTX couldn't have happened. Uh, Celsius couldn't have happened. What else was there? Actually, Prime Trust is an interesting one because they they lost the keys, even though they they lost access to the keys, even though they were custodying. Um, there is, other than the fact that regulators require you to have a chief information security officer, um, a regular audit, meet a minimum security standard. Um, then in, in that it forces you to be a better, more secure company uh, just in meeting their requirements. It still doesn't, even then, because then you'd have to, you know, for example, Quadrica, where some, the founder just dies and they've got the key and therefore no one can access the funds. Under a regulated environment, you'd have to have a business continuity disaster recovery and then that would have to be audited and then you'd have to provide that to the regulator. So no, it's not perfect, but... Um, all of those issues that we have seen, there would have been a lot of, there's a lot of checks and controls to ensure that that doesn't happen, but you still got people that could commit fraud with their regulator. See, and that's, that's really good. And that's comforting. Um, and that's some of the things that it's like, we need to communicate to new Bitcoiners or normies that, that, this is what we're dealing with. I've got people who are like, oh, well, BlackRock is just going to end up just like FTX, right? And I'm like, um, no, that, you know, for all of the reasons that you just listed, all of the things that FTX did wrong, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, BlackRock legally can't, you know, they're, they're holding the funds in custody with Coinbase. So there's a third party custodian. Um, Coinbase is not a qualified custodian, but they're, They've got their money transmitter rules, and so the regulator needs to figure out, um, you know, that. But they're also a public reporting company that needs to demonstrate uh, that, you know, it would be massive fraud if they uh, filed their public accounts and didn't have the correct liabilities to match, you know, the assets to match all the liabilities. Uh, BlackRock, I mean, I haven't actually read the prospectuses, but my understanding is when you buy an ETF, they're not, uh, they're not allowed to use those funds. They just simply have to back it and match the units with the uh, with what's in custody. Um, now, when they they've they've applied for a bunch of their funds to be able to invest in the ETF, and that's where they can leverage. But that's sold in compliance with securities laws because those are mutual funds. So I, I don't see how Black BlackRock. The I guess the systemic risk event is if Coinbase got hacked. Um, then that's one of the, the major risks where the, the whole thing could fail. Right, and I guess I just want to contrast that um, 
with yeah, it, you're right. That's exactly right. And w- like what Sailor's saying, what you're saying, this this regulation is good because it protect it gives clarity for people who want to do business in Bitcoin, like Sailor, like you, like so many of us. Um, and then it also protects the you know the low level investor, consumer, retail purchaser of Bitcoin. You know, it, it's curious, and I, I don't quite understand this mindset, but there seems to be this loud trumpet from the crypto maxis. Um, like very much the, like the non hardcore Bitcoiners, like the crypto tick tips couple and a bunch of the, the crypto crypto folks who seem to want a wild west environment where there's no partnership with the state and there's no real regulation of crypto entities, which seem, which seems to just lend itself to you know, scams and rug pulls, which I don't think we want. And I don't, I don't know why so many people in that space want no regulation. Oh, it's just decentralized DeFi and we're all just going to do it ourselves. But I don't know. Yeah, it's, a, it's an ideological mismatch. So when I first got involved in Bitcoin, you know, it was us versus the banks and it was a bottom up activist movement to disrupt banking. Um, and that is still the roots of Bitcoin. Um, what we learned over the decades is that, um, well, not decades yet, uh, over the, the 13 years I've been involved, is that you definitely want centralized companies to be regulated, but you also want to preserve the power of a peer-to-peer market. So it also just comes down to how ideological driven, but because it, it then comes back into the decentralization conversation where Bitcoin is decentralized, but when someone's issuing a token, you know, the, these are, they're not securities, but they need some of the protections that securities offer. Um, and so you can even kill it by shoehorning it into securities, or you can just create sound disclosures and recognizing that there is a quantum of centralization versus decentralization. But it's a very tricky problem because you do have to preserve I believe you have to, you do have to preserve the the decentralized, unregulated market of peer to peer transactions and self custody. Um, but whenever you're onboarding and offboarding, you know governments are going to want their cut, so they'll want all the data for tax. Um, and uh, you know they they're never going to give up on their mission to try and you know, uh, well, fulfill the, the, the obligation. So centralized companies 100% need to be regulated is when they're just taking the decentralized ideology and shoehorning it on top of centralized ideology. And then there are bad actor things. So securities, I think market manipulation, insider trading, security law disclosures, protections, I think those are all really good things. Anti-money laundering laws are just a, a grab you know, it's just a tax collection grab. It's it's like uh, repackaging, repackaging the fear of terrorism financing when really they just want all the data, and then that puts their users at uh, unnecessary, you know, higher risks because you're collecting ever more data, um, and you know that's that's not really consumer protection. That's just governments protecting tax collection. So there's it's kind of like a, a big a big mismatch of pain frustration because who like who who i mean geez has anyone tried to onboard with coinbase recently or any financial institution anyone tried to put like a significant amount of money from bitcoin into a bank it's like it's painful really painful Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, that ma- that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, it's, we we have to have we have to have the centralized companies, you know, to function as on and off ramps, um, in, in order to participate in the ecosystem. Um, but yeah, you're right. It, it is super painful, and that kind of goes back to the Fred's point from the very beginning: is that these ETFs are great because um, it makes adoption for grandma to participate in sound money much easier. Um, and, and yeah, it's not this, um, it's not this, you know, amazing utopia of everyone is transacting on layer one peer to peer, but 
in in reality, at least for now, that's just not going to happen, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's and that's the main thing. There's something for every everything. Like there was, there was no amount of you know, my 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 father lost the whole of Bitcoin upside because I kept telling him, yeah, you should own this. Uh, I ended up just buying it for him, and then eventually, you know, his his mind got to a point where my wealth became his wealth type thing. But um, there was nothing that would ever get my father to be able to buy Bitcoin and put it on a, on a hardware wallet. And if I, I do believe that if there was an ETF, when I first started saying he should put some of his um, retirement in Bitcoin, uh, I think he would have done it. But because there wasn't, he didn't. Yep, yep, I agree. Hey, guys, uh, great talk. I got to jump off of here, but this has been great. Really appreciate it, Simon and Michael, for hosting. Thanks for being here. Hey, Grant, what's up, man? Hey, I'm, uh, thank you for ring, bringing me up. I'm curious as to the explanation or a description of when you said it was hard to move from Bitcoin back into the banks. Were you talking about selling your Bitcoin and then moving the cash to the bank? Can you, can you elaborate? Yeah, well, I mean... The bane of my life, probably, yeah, the bane of my life has been Bitcoin to fiat, fiat to Bitcoin. Um, and any time you need to interact, you know, when, when someone, I'll give you an example. Um, when I wanted to buy a high-end real estate because I just wanted to live in it, um, banks hate it when you just want to buy things out, right? Uh, they see, like, money as risk. Um, they, all they want to do is sell you a mortgage. And so because I didn't want a mortgage, but my wealth was in Bitcoin and I tried to persuade the person that wanted to set the real estate developer to sell it to us in Bitcoin. I wind him up all the time now because um, I, I calculate every single year and send him a text message of, uh, to the developer that if you, had, if you had taken that Bitcoin when I tried to persuade you, um, basically everything he's ever worked for and all of the all of the transactions he's done in real estate have just gone to has gone to you know minuscule returns compared to what he would have if he just accepted bitcoin but, so it's but like, yeah. it, it wasn't a bank it wasn't a bank the seller no, so he the, the he, seller didn't know how to accept or didn't want to accept the bitcoin yeah the seller didn't want to accept the bitcoin so he forced me to go through a bank but what, what does that have to do with the bank though uh, but then the bank wouldn't accept. So then the bank said to me, okay, so I had to disclose that I earned my wealth through Bitcoin. And then they said, all right, well, if this is a high value transaction, um, I went to the first bank and said, look, here's how I earned my wealth. Here's the entire history of how those Bitcoin achieved that value. And then it went up to the compliance officer and the compliance just said, no, we're not taking this. We can't take this money. And then I went through about five or six different banks, just trying to find one that would accept the deposit. And then when I found one that would accept the deposit to allow me to purchase the house, um, it took nine months and a forensic investigation where I had to go through each, each. Basically, they said, well, firstly, we don't know how to investigate whether this came from crime or not. And so they said, can you go and get someone that knows how to do this analysis? And so then I had to go and pay for a report that did the chain analysis, and then I had to trace the transactions back to all the a bunch of Bitcoin mining that I did, and then I had to show how I originally paid for the investment in the mining, and then the forensic investigator basically just took it all the way back to the original chain, and then I had to show the original transactions. Once I went through that whole process, um, they put together a report and then the report said, okay, these source of funds and source of wealth is legitimate. Um, then I think yeah, the yeah, bank so they, they were, they were covering, they were covering their, their own banking license Correct. against KYC. Yeah. Uh, but and so most I mean, banks just say, and then, and then I got two bank accounts shut down in the process of just trying to ask the question. And then suddenly they're like, all right, no, this is too high risk for us. Um, thank you very much. We're no, we're no longer happy to serve you. You don't borrow enough from us. <laughs> uh, there's, no, there's just massive risk here. We're just doing a large transaction and we don't make any money out of it. 
Um, yeah. So, you know, well, well, they, they, they are, they are in the business of making money, you know, so. Exactly. Exactly. So, and quite understandably, why, why would you take all this risk and do all this work when you're not going to make anything out of it? So, <laughs> but yeah, just yeah, I, know, the whole... I know I had an experience not, not involving Bitcoin, but I was started a JP Morgan account and we had a number of accounts that we were interested in depositing. One of which is a crowdfunding source. Uh, I, I wanted to put my personal funds in there, but they did not want to touch the crowdfunding just because it's not that it's not because they didn't think I know my customer in this case KYC, but they're like, why, why risk it for, you know, it was a significant amount of money, very significant, but in comparison to their balance sheet and the name of the company and any headline risk, it's not worth it to them. So I don't know that that, you know, I think that that's about anything, not just about Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even though Bitcoin right. complicates it, obviously, but yeah. Uh, but, you know, as soon as you say the word crypto or Bitcoin and you're dealing with a bank, you, you're going to have problems. You're going to have big problems unless you're going for a, a spec. And, you know, eventually the specialists came along. Um, but these specialists are under such extreme scrutiny as well. So they make your life hell just to try and transact. You know, Every single payment I have to do once you're a Bitcoin friendly bank knows that you're, you know, your source of funds, source of wealth. Every single payment, you've got to produce an invoice, you've got to produce KYC for the supplier. You know, it, it really, I mean, the traditional financial system is just broken. Like, it's broken. And AML KYC is just getting worse and worse and worse. You know, until you capitulate into a central bank digital currency and digital ID and social credit score. And, you know, that's, that's the end game of, and then they'll make the user experience slightly better. But the second you want to do something with your money that they don't like, um, they'll just slap a negative interest rate on you or a, a passport block or uh, your your central bank digital currency will get some kind of triple taxation or whatever it is. But yeah, the, the user experience of international banking, like it's just, it's broken. It's broken so badly. Unless you're leveraging. Again, if you're, if you're borrowing the money from the bank, then they're happy with that source of funds. When you've got wealth, they don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> See, I, I, I do think the tides are changing a little bit, though. I know I saw there was a filing by some of the major banks that they're looking to try and custody crypto, get that regulation approved and rolled out. So, I mean, although they've been oppositional up to this point, I think behind the scenes... I think they know their time's up. But you know what the issue was there? Um, Basel rules. So the, as the price of Bitcoin goes up, they didn't, they didn't treat it as a separate asset that's held in custody by a client. So you could have a custodian. But if the bank engages in it, um, they get a capital call. So they have to meet a higher capital call as the price of Bitcoin goes up to match the assets and the liabilities. So... If you're currently, if you were a, a small bank and you were holding Bitcoin and the price of it's going up, then you've got to go out there and be raising finance or the, you know, the bank is going to, you're going to be in trouble with your regulator because you can't meet your capital requirements. And so that kind of converges on the trend of everything moving to these large mega banks. And then eventually a large mega bank just gets taken over by a central bank digital currency. Yeah. 